So now we go on to esophageal pathology. The first one we're going to talk about is esophageal tears. There's two different types of esophageal tears. They differ by how much of the gut wall is torn. So Mallory Weiss tear is a tear of only the mucosa, so the innermost layer of uh, right next to the lumen. And this usually occurs at the gastroesophageal junction and is due to forceful vomiting. So forceful vomiting is going to increase is going to cause increased intraluminal pressure inside the esophagus and all that pressure is going to cause a tear in the gastric uh, mucosa. And this is at the junction between the esophagus and the stomach. So what can happen is you can have bleeding of the submucosal vessels due to that tearing. So your clinical features are going to be similar. You're going to have bleeding and you're vomiting, so it's going to be bloody vomit. And it's going to be painful. You just tore your it's going to be tearing of the mucosa. You're going to have epigastric pain because that's where that gastroesophageal junction is. So what you usually see is you see this in the patient with an alcoholic or a bulimic because those are the ones that are going to have this really forceful vomiting that's strong enough to cause a mucosal tear. And I remember, again, Mallory Weiss is the one with the mucosal because the next one is Borhoff syndrome, and that's the transmural one. That means that the whole esophageal wall gets torn apart. Okay, so this is the mucosa. All of that gets torn, and now you have a hole in your esophagus. So that basically, again, it also comes from forceful vomiting. Both of them come from, come from forceful vomiting. This one is just more severe. And so you have this all this air and fluid and food that goes down your esophagus. And guess what? Instead of going down in the stomach now, instead of going downwards, it can actually leave. And it can go into the surrounding structures and mess it all up, cause inflammation, cause irritation. Go into the mediastinum and the lung pleura. So as you can tell, this is probably a lot more severe than the Mallory White syndrome. You're gonna have similar symptoms of pain. The other thing you can have is subcutaneous emphysema. And what the, what the heck does that mean? Subcutaneous so under the skin, emphysema, that's air getting into the soft tissues under the skin. That's subcutaneous emphysema. Again, remember we have air leakage and you have your skin and the air is going to enter here. And so you actually get, when you, when you have that, if you push on the skin, you get this like crackling sound because that's because that's all that air is under it. The other thing you're going to have is you can have, again I said you can cause infection, so you can have all these in infectious symptoms. You can have fever, shortness of breath, and then if it's very severe, you can get septic shock. And again, this is a very severe disease. It can be rapidly progressive. So you need this is a surgical emergency. You need to open it up and fix what well, fix the problem. So that's it for our esophageal tears. The main key difference here is the mucosal tear versus the transmural tear. And then if it's transmural, you can have this esophageal air fluid leak into the mediastinum and the lung pleura, and it's going to cause a lot of big bad symptoms. Next is get. Uh, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. So it's reflux of contents from the gastric area of the stomach into the esophagus. Simple as that. And that's because usually normally you have a nice little sphincter, lower esophageal sphincter. But if that's incompetent, the, if there's an incompetence of the gastroesophageal junction, then stuff can go up. Your, um, your, all that acidic contents in your stomach can go up. And so all this stuff is going to irritate. Your esophagus is not prepared for this. It's going to get irritation. So you're going to get these symptoms like heartburn, regurgitation, and dysphagia. You're going to get an acidic taste in your mouth because all that sour stuff is from the, from the acid in your stomach. And this, this heartburn can be a mimic of cardiac chest pain. Remember, cardiac chest pain is always something we worry about because you always want to, what are you scared about? You're scared of, the, of a heart attack. So this, is a, this can be a mimic. The other thing that you can have is you can have extra esophageal symptoms, including things like a chronic nocturnal cough, hoarseness. And why would that be? Because you're getting all this irritating stuff that's going up. It's going to go all the way up to your, to your throat, and it's going to cause irritation, and you're going to get a cough. So that's GERD, very common disease. Next is esophagitis, simple inflammation of the esophagus. These patients, because it's inflamed their esophagus, they're going to have pain uh, with difficult pain and difficulty with swallowing. Now there are many etiologies of this inflammation of your esophagus. I use a nice mnemonic here called PEACE. It's called P is for pill induced, so you have a fat pill that goes down your esophagus and it gets stuck. Okay, you have a fat pill. Sometimes you, you've seen those pills, sometimes they can be really fat. You have, maybe the patients don't uh, drink enough water, it gets stuck, 
causes inflammation of the esophagus. Infectious, you're gonna have infectious causes including candida, HSV, and CMV. You're gonna have eosinophilic esophagitis. And that's because you have, uh, maybe you have allergies to a food, you have food allergens, comes in here, causes, and the food allergen causes this allergic reaction that's gonna to lead to dysphagia and food impaction. So it's an allergic reaction to food that you just ate. Uh, it doesn't happen immediately, it can happen a couple weeks later. And the key thing is you're gonna see is eosinophils, and again, eosinophils in allergies. Caustic esophagitis, that's when you ingest caustic substances. Maybe you just drank some bleach because you got confused. And then you're gonna get some massive, massive irritation of the esophageal tract. Finally, we have erosive esophagitis, and that's basically GERD, where you have that hydrochloric acid coming up and eroding your, um, your esophageal lining causing inflammation. So again, peace are all the etiologies of esophagitis. Uh, infectious esophagitis, I'm gonna talk a little bit about more. There's a couple identifying features to understand, to know which uh, infectious uh, agent is causing the problem. So Canada has a white pseudomembrane. So that's super easy to remember because you already see that white membrane, membranous film in the mouth with the Canada infection. Uh, HSV causes punched out ulcers. So I remember this one because H is, uh, the H is, I think about a hole puncher causing these punched out ulcers in the esophagus. And then the difference is that CMV has the linear ulcers. This actually is very testable, so, so be sure to remember this. HSV punched out ulcers, CMV linear ulcers. Uh, they'll, so they'll tell you this, we see this inflammation, we see punched out ulcers, which, what's the etiology, and you should be able to know that HSV is causing it. Alright, next is achalasia. Achalasia is a failure of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax. And that is because there's normally some inhibitory neurons there that, that um, they inhibit the contraction of the sphincter. So they cause relaxation. If they degenerate, you lose them, then you lose the ability to relax and your sphincter is too tight and food can't go through. So what's going to happen? Food's going to get stuck. So you're going to get this failure of trouble swallowing. You're going to get food regurgitation because food's not going to the stomach, so it's, going to, it's got to go somewhere eventually. It's going to go back out your mouth. Finally, you have bad breath because, again, you have food fermenting and rotting in, in your esophagus. And so you get bad breath. So all these all these symptoms make sense, super easy. And then on barium swallow, what you're gonna see, swallow barium, it's gonna fill up your esophagus and you're gonna take images. What you're gonna see is this. This is, this is the whole esophagus, this huge massive dilation. And eventually it's gonna, it's, you get this bird beaking. This, this is the bird beak here, it's very narrow because it's a very tight, very contracted because what was the etiology of this? Remember you have degeneration of the inhibitory neurons in the sphincter, in the sphincter. It can't relax, so it's very tight. So that's very classic. This picture is super classic for achalasia. It's super easy. Coincides with the path, um, path, path, pathophysiology. So the next one is, we're going to go through a bunch of different pathologies. We're going to make a quick run through. You can just skip this and read it if you want. But we have esophageal strictures. So what's a stricture? It's basically tightening. And it's tightening in the esophagus. And you get strictures. Why would you get a stricture? You get strictures from irritation slash inflammation, and that causes fibrosis. Fibrosis causes tightening. So often the irritation is arising from caustic ingestion, or you can have GERD. Both of those just cause irritation, inflammation, fibrosis. So next is esophageal varices. Varices are dilated submucosal veins in the esophagus, and these can arise from portal hypertension and cirrhotic. So again, these are all the veins. These are abnormally dilated. They shouldn't be protruding out like this in the esophagus. Uh, we'll talk about portal hypertension a lot more later. But basically, these vessels are very, they're very, um, let's say, fragile. So they can be ruptured, and if they're ruptured, you're going to get a lot of bleeding. And this can actually be life-threatening, and you're going to get hematemesis, which is vomiting of blood, because you're going to get blood in the esophagus, and it's going to go out through your mouth. Next one is plumber Vincent syndrome. It's just a triad of dysphagia, which is trouble swallowing, anemia, and esophageal webs. That's it. That's the triad. You've got to memorize it. There's a nice mnemonic in first aid if you want. Dysphagia, iron deficiency, anemia, esophageal webs. Scleroderma. 
Do you remember scleroderma? Do you remember what is the syndrome? What is the mnemonic for it? Remember, the mnemonic is CREST, CREST syndrome. So what does that stand for? CREST is calcin C is calcinosis, R is Raynaud's, E is esophageal dysmotility, which is why we're talking about it here. S is sclerodactyly, um, T is telangiectasias. So that is scleroderma. So next, finally, is the diffuse esophageal spasms. So diff diffuse esophageal spasm is basically a periodic, non-peristaltic contraction of the esophagus. So it's non-peristaltic, so it's not going to not going to help propel food down. It's just going to um, just spasm and contract all of a sudden. It's periodic. And again, this is due to a loss of inhibitory, inhibitory innervation of the muscle layer of the esophagus. So you lose innervation, so you get this diffuse spasms. And what's going to happen to these patients, they're going to have solid slash liquid dysphagia and chest pain intermittently because, again, it's periodic. And it's going to be dysphagia, and it's going to be both to solids and liquids because... Again, you lose peristalsis, so nothing can go down. Nothing is, you have trouble swallowing both solids and liquids. So that is it for a quick review. And finally, we're going to go to Barrett's esophagus. So Barrett's esophagus stands for a metaplasia of the lower esophagus. So normally your lower esophagus is a stratified squamous epithelium. Metaplasia means that it gets cha it changes its type, and it's going to become a... Uh, Intestinal, epi intestinal type epithelium, which is non ciliated columnar epithelium with go goblet cells. So, if you see non ciliated columnar epithelium with goblet cells in your esophagus, that is abnormal. That is intestinal type of epithelium in the esophagus due to metaplasia. Um, this arises from chronic irritation, as metaplasia usually does, and it's usually from GERD. So, GERD, lower esophagus, remember esophageal sphincter. Then you have your stomach, you have your acid coming up, causing inflammation, and it's going to cause metaplasia in the lower esophagus. And this, we, t we care about this because it can progress to esophageal adenocarcinoma. So let's talk about esophageal cancer now. There's two types of cancers, squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. Let's talk with the squamous cell carcinoma. And the key thing is squamous cell carcinoma happens in the upper two-thirds of the esophageal tract. Okay, and this is the more common one worldwide. The risk factors are stuff that go down the esophagus. That's why is that's why it's the upper two thirds. Um, and then for adenocarcinoma, it's the lower one third of the esophageal tract. So this is more common in the USA. So let's see, esophageal tract sphincter. Okay, so this is adeno, and this is squamous. So again, I said the stuff that goes down are the risk factors for squamous cell carcinoma and the stuff that irritates the esophagus. So things like alcohol, smoking, hot liquids, they go down your esophagus and they cause burning, irritation, alcohol causes damage, leading to um, the squamous cells that are normally in the esophagus becoming cancerous because they get damaged, become cancer. I don't know carcinoma is the lower one third and it's because of stuff that's going back up, okay? So we talked about this GERD, Barrett's esophagus, hydrochloric acid irritation leading to metaplasia. So your squamous cells are becoming adeno cells. They're going to be ciliated columnar epithelium goblet cells. They become glandular, they become cancer. The other uh, risk factors are obesity, which basically reinforces the GERD because obesity increases intraluminal pressure, increases more acid secretion. And smoking is a risk factor for both of these. The smoking is pretty much a risk factor for mo many of the cancers that we see. Now the present presentation here is similar. So what you're going to get is you're going to get a progressive dysphagia. What does that mean? First of all, remember what does dysphagia mean? Dysphagia is trouble swallowing. Progressive means first you have trouble dif trouble swallowing uh, solids because you have this little tumor here. So your little hamburger here it can't go down, but your liquid can just go down. But eventually it's going to progress into trouble swallowing liquids as well. That's why it's called progressive dysphagia. Let's say if you cancer here, blocking the whole thing, even that liquid can, is trouble going down. So that's why we have a progressive dysphagia. The other thing you get is you get weight loss because obviously if you're not eating very well, you're gonna, well, first of all, you're not eating well. Second of all, you have cancer. So cancer, again, you just cause weight loss. 
Um, so that's it for all our pathology of the esophagus. Uh, it's kind of a whirlwind tour. Uh, so on to the next section.